All right, folks, if you would turn in your Bibles, please, to the book of Revelation, chapter 3, verse 7. We're going to try to cover verses 7 through verses verses 7 through 13, excuse me. We're going to talk about the church in Philadelphia. Now, as we begin this, I want to have you keep your thumb there in the book of Revelation, but I'd like you to turn to John 13. Please turn to John 13, verse 34 and 35. John 13, 34 and 35. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. As I have loved you, that you may also love one another. By this all will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Love holds a lot of weight in Scripture. In fact, it's one of the identifying characteristics of a Christian. We are supposed to be known for our love for one another. Sometimes Christians can be really, really critical. And Christians can be very, very unloving. And yet, That is the predominant characteristic, that of love that is supposed to identify and to mark us. And I think we live in a society today, it seems like everybody is so busy and everybody's so preoccupied. And if they're not preoccupied, they think they're preoccupied. (laughs) And it's all that people can do, it seems, to just manage their own lives. Just to be able to take care of the daily things that need to be done And that leaves very little left for pouring that out on other people. Now, I realize there are times and circumstances in our life where it is overwhelming. Times when uh, it's all you can do to keep it together because you're juggling so many things and you have so many trials and stuff going on in your life. But that's not all the time. Hopefully, that's only once in a while. And those other times, we're supposed to be pouring out our love on other people. Now, it doesn't mean that we shouldn't be loving during the trials, but those trials are an opportunity for people to love us. So there's this constant commission, if you will, of love that should be going on amongst us. One of the things I know that I know that I know, but I easily forget, and that's that every single one of you go through trials. The old walk a mile in my shoes. If you get close to anybody, you sit down and you realize they're human too. They have things that are going on in their life and they're sometimes overwhelming. And you have some of us that are expressive about that. And then you have others that are nonverbal. They won't share them with you. They won't tell you what's going on in their life unless you take the time to sit down and get to know them. But it's so easy when we're in our own situation to become introverted and think that we're the only ones in the world going through this. But the reality of it is, you don't have to look too far from you, even this morning, down the row, and there's other people going through some really difficult times. We live also in a time where it seems that selfishness is at an all-time high. Maybe it's been that way forever. But it seems as though there is this self-consuming thing that takes place and we're only concerned about our life and about how everything in life revolves around our own individual lives. But it is the privilege of a Christian to try to look beyond that, to try to look out at other people's lives and see some of their needs. Sometimes all it requires is a hug. Sometimes all it requires is stopping to pray with someone. Maybe just a phone call. Maybe just taking a meal over to someone. Or just letting them know that you care about them. It can make a lot of difference. Let me give you 1 John also. If you would turn to 1 John chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4. Verse 
1 John chapter 4, verses 7 and 8. Many songs been written about these verses. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. Let me ask you a question. What does love look like? It's easy to talk about love. If you've been a Christian for very long, you know that that's a a strong part of the Bible. You're probably even familiar with 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter. But what does it look like in reality? What does that look like in reality? You see, we have to know what that looks like in reality to know if we're, if we're being loving, if we're being kind. We can, we can uh, make mental assent to the premise, to the idea, but if it's not being carried out practically, you have to wonder if we're really operating in that love. What do I mean by that? Well, a husband with his wife, how does he treat her? What does that look like? He might say that he loves her, but is, does it look like love? Is it, is it there? We might say that we love our kids, but what does that look like? The children may say that they love us, but what does that look like? What does this kind of love look like? We live in a society now where it is so easy to feel unloved. Now, I'm not a psychologist, I'm not a psychiatrist, I'm, I'm a Bible teacher. But I do know that there are some folks who are starved of that love as a child. Whether it's a mom not at home or a dad not at home or having parents that never really told them, hey, I love you, I care about you. And it's easy for a certain type of an individual to feel unloved. Because that was kind of a pattern set up in their, lo- in their life. They find themselves wanting to perform a lot because they like approval, because they need the approval, because they didn't get it. And so now they're in a place in their life where they, they really need that. And you might say, well, that's their problem. No, it's not. It's all of our problem. We're all broken. We're all wounded. We all need to feel loved. And it's very easy to feel unloved. And Revelation chapter 12 verse 10 tells us that Satan is, and I quote, the accuser of our brethren. And he accuses them before our God day and night. Constant accusing. Constant berating. Constant trying to put us down. Now you might say, well, I'm a Christian. You know, Satan can't do anything to me. He can sure try. He can sure try. And we have enough of our own personality that maybe hasn't completely been given over to the Lord. That he's got plenty of inroads to to mess with us. So keep in mind that any single Sunday we gather, any single Wednesday that we gather, and any other day and hour of the week, the brethren are being accused. Now, even as a Christian, you got to admit, don't you hear that voice once in a while that says, you're worthless? Don't you hear that voice once in a while that says, you're ugly? Don't you hear that voice that says, you're never going to amount to anything? That God doesn't love you? That God is not there with you? If you've never heard those words, I would really like to spend a couple days getting to know you. Because I really want to know how you do it. The Lord, I think, has made us with the need to feel loved. I think every single one of us need to feel loved and accepted. Sometimes things can be said without even realizing that you say it. You might say it in a positive sense to one person, but in the process, when it's in the earshot of another person, it puts them down. 
or it hurts them. In other words, what I'm trying to say is that we are bombarded all the time with those accusations. We're bombarded all the time with a lack of love. And I think that it's our job, especially in church, to be loved and to give love and to forgive and to move on and to encourage each other daily to not listen to that other voice, that loud voice that comes in and accuses and condemns, but to listen to that small, still voice of God that says that he loves us. Church should be the last place in the world that you go and leave and feel unloved. This church in Philadelphia, they are the star pupil. They get the gold star because this church is different. Clovis Chapel said this. He says, Were it my privilege to go back across the years and attend a service at one of these seven churches, I think I should choose the church at Philadelphia. Philadelphia was the church of brotherly love. You're going to find that they were not just hearers of the word, but they were doers of the word. Somehow they had figured out how to get past all of their own things and to be able to express God's love to everyone else. And because of that, God had opened up many, many doors for them for ministry. It is the only church in the seven churches that are mentioned, that we've been talking about, it's the only church that God has nothing negative to say. It's the only one. And their primary gift, the one that he really, really commends them for, is this act of love. Let me give you a little bit of background on the church. They were located in a, a place of rich farmland. This place was subject to volca uh, volcanoes, and as a result of that, there was a lot of volcanic ash, and that added to making them a rich farmland. So it was a pretty luxurious place. There had been a time when uh, an earthquake had pretty much destroyed the area, but at the time of Philadelphia, it had been rebuilt and was doing extremely well. Please take a look at chapter 3, verse 7, the first part of verse 7. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write. And this is what he wanted him to write. These things says he who is holy, he who is true, he who has the key of David, he who opens and no one shuts and shuts and no one opens. You guys have seen that each time we go through one of these books, we take a look at how the Lord addresses himself because that's extremely important in the message that he's giving to each one of these churches. It usually uh, relates directly to what he has, has to say to them. It's the ad admonition that he's giving to them. Now, in describing himself as he who is holy, uh, he who is holy, what is he saying? Now, I want you to take this not just on the uh, on this, uh, micro level, but on the broad level. Who is holy? Well, let me give you Samuel, uh, second, I think it's 1 Samuel 2.2. 2. I think it's 1 Samuel. If you're looking it up, if it's 2 Samuel, I made a mistake. It's not in my notes. But anyway, it says here, No one is holy like the Lord, for there is none besides him, nor is there any rock like our rock. John told us in 1 John 3.5, In him there was no sin. Pilate and his wife called him what? A just man, saying we find no fault in him. He is a just man. By him saying he is holy, he is saying he is God. We have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There's only one who is holy. So he's talking to this church and he's saying, he who is holy, I am God. I am the one that is addressing you. Love is a characteristic of God's holiness. Why is that? Well, because you kind of have to put away a whole lot of junk in order to love someone. Don't you? I don't, I don't mean just like or a friend, but when you really love someone, don't you put away a lot of junk? Have you ever noticed that it kind of seems to be a human trait that people can 
love you from a distance, but when they get up close, they don't love you so much. Yeah, have you noticed that? It's like if, they're, if you're from a distance, they don't see all the imperfections. But if they get up close to you, they start seeing the wrinkles and the marks and the imperfections. And when they begin to see the imperfections, I think it's, a, it's an insecurity thing. I think when they begin to see the imperfections in you, they get scared of their own imperfections. Then they start pointing them out and they start becoming a big deal and then they back away from you. But I think a true friend loves you in spite of all those imperfections. I think a true friend that even though you got your quirks, even though you got your little things, you got your this, you got your that, they love you. I think that's the the real mark of love is knowing someone. I mean knowing them, really knowing them and you choose to love them anyway. If you take that to its logical end, isn't that God? And God didn't give us love because we're perfect. He knew all the pock marks. <laughs> he knew all the wrinkles. He knew all the folds. He knew everything. He knows everything about us, and He didn't give us salvation because He went, You're awesome. He looked at us and said, You really need me. <laughs> and He gave us his love and I think that's how you know a true friend you say just love you because I think that's the proper kind of love between a husband and a wife between parents and kids between kids and their parents between good friends they know you they know you're not perfect they don't expect you to be perfect but they love you anyway And I believe one of the reasons why he's addressing this, he who is holy, is he's trying to let them know this love that they have, it comes from him. I think he's pleased because it represents him. It's one of those purer forms of love. He also says, he who is true. G. Campbell Morgan tells us that the difference between holy and true, he says this, As the Holy One, Christ is right in character. As the Holy One, Christ is right in character. As the True One, He is right in conduct. Let me say that again. As the Holy One, Christ is right in character. As the True One, He is right in conduct. Because the Lord's character is pure, his conduct is also pure and correct. Now, let's relate that to us. Let's relate it to ourselves. When our character is found in Christ, our conduct will be Christ-like. Does that make sense? When our character is found in Jesus, we begin to take on his characteristics. We begin to look like him. We begin to hopefully act like him. And as a result of that, we become Christ-like. And I think the more that we hang out with him, hopefully the more that that is true. Hopefully the more we begin to take on the fragrance of the Lord. Not just the laws, not just jumping through the hoops, not just a religious act or a religious activity, but it begins to permeate us from the inside out. It's like couples who have been married for 150 years, they look like each other. Have you ever seen those pictures of the, of the people and their dogs and how much the dog looks like? The more we hang out with Jesus, the more we, the more we begin to resemble Him. So, again, he's talking about the truth. He's talking about the love. So, he's calling himself the truth. This is not new news. If you look in John 14, 6, those of you that have your Bibles, if you look at John 14, 6, it says, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the what? I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. Truth used to be an important thing. I think we all want truth. You know, they have those little truth and lending, truth and lending statements. 
anymore, it's really hard to know if you're getting the truth from anyone. You call up on, you call up any place and say, hey, do you have this? No, we're out of them. You go down there and there's four on the shelf. They didn't want to go from, from where they were out on the phone to go look and see if they had any there. It's hard to get the truth anymore from people. To get, to get jobs and to get bids, a lot of times people will kind of be a little shady about things. You go to buy a car, sometimes you've got that fine print that, that you're, not, you're not understanding. And, you know, guys, please know and understand this, that if you go in and they say, what do you want your payment to be, don't tell them. They'll make your payment what they want it to be. They'll just give you 60 years of financing. You don't ask, you don't answer. You just say, what's your bottom line on the car? I'm going to buy one today and I can buy it from you or I can buy it from someone else. Tell me what your bottom dollar is. And they'll hate you, but you'll get a good price on the car. But that's, the, that's those things that we've grown up in. And, and truth in politics. That's kind of an oxymoron, isn't it? It's kind of hard to find the truth anymore. But Jesus is the truth. In 2 Corinthians 3, 2, let me back up. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 6, it says, Love does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the what? Rejoices in the truth. So guys, real love has to be a result of Christ. It has to be a result of Jesus. There are some people that it's going to be really difficult for us to love because it goes against our nature or what we like or what we prefer. But in Christ, God can put that love for you. He can put that love there for you. You know, I've always been told that if you lack love for an individual, start praying for them. Because you can't pray for them and not love them. What will happen is if, as you begin to pray for them, God will begin to soften your heart and God will begin to give you love for that individual. All right, let's move on to verse 8. It says, I know your works. See, I have set before you an open door and no one can shut that. For you have a little strength and you've kept my word and you have not denied me. Interesting. They have a little strength and God's commending them. First, we need to understand that he and he alone holds the key to salvation. That's a door that he's opened and no one can close it. He is also that door by which we must come to get salvation and it must come through him to get to the Father. What am I saying? I'm saying that Christianity, Jesus Christ, is the only way to heaven. You might say, well, that's kind of narrow. Yeah, it is. He talks about the narrow road, and he talks about few people finding it. Again, when we live in a, in a world that is full of sin, we want many, many doors to heaven. We want doors that will say, you can do whatever you want and go to heaven. You can live any way you want. You can live any lifestyle that you want. You can do absolutely everything because after all, if he's a loving God, he wouldn't prevent anyone from going to heaven. Wrong. That's a lie. He's provided a way. John 3.16 says he gave his only son that whoever believes in him would have everlasting life. We know that he's provided the way. That door is open. That door is wide open, but there's only one door. And that is through Jesus Christ. If you look at John 10, 9, he says, in John 10, 9, he says, I am the... Are you there yet? I am the door. I am the door. He did not say, I am one of many doors. What's behind door number one? What's behind door number three? What's behind door number two? Choose the one you want. He didn't say that. He says, I am the door. And if anyone enters by me, he will be what? He'll be saved. Saved from what? Well, we're going to see all that in the rest of the book of Revelation, aren't we? 
but they will be saved and they will go in and out and find pasture. Second, he says he holds the key to the, to the doors of service. He holds the key. Now, this church was full of love and God had opened the doors of service to them. Why? Because the world needs to be loved. Lennon and McCartney said, all you need is love. Actually, it was Lennon who wrote the song, but they put co-author in there. All you need is love. That's not true. Love is an important uh, item, but it's not the love. It's the object of our love. It's the source of our love that we need. People love all kinds of things. Banana splits casseroles I better stop now because you're finding my list (laughs) but we love all kinds of things we love our pets but that's not the kind of love we're talking about we're talking about the kind of love that goes beyond just feeling and makes a decision to love in spite of the feelings and that has to come from Jesus Christ but he's telling them you guys got that nailed You guys have that down, and as a result, I'm opening up all kinds of doors for you. And these doors that I open of ministry, no one can shut them. And once they're shut, nobody can pry them open. I don't like that song that used to be on the radio, and and I forget exactly the lyrics, but if God closes the door, he'll open a window. You don't like that. When he closes the door, it's, it's closed. Now, I'm not saying he doesn't give us other options. That's not what I'm saying. But it's like, oh, if God didn't like that, he'll change his mind and he'll do it this way. And if he doesn't like that, he'll change his mind and do it that way. And he'll just provide all kinds of ways for you to be disobedient. It's just not true. It's simply not true. When God closes a door, no one can pry those open except for him. Now, I do think That's where repentance comes in. That's where getting back in fellowship with God comes in. And I believe those doors can open up again. But they open up by Him. They open up by Him. Lehman Strauss believes that this church represents a a time period that immediately followed the Reformation period. Like from between 1750 and about 1950. It was a time when men like William Carey, John and Charles Wesley, George Whitefield, uh, Adoniram Judson, Charles Finney, Dwight Moody, Billy Sunday, they filled the world with the gospel. There was a door wide open. Have you noticed that that door is not wide open anymore? There was a time when you could sit down and share the gospel with people and they wanted to hear it. But that door is getting, getting much, much more narrow. After the war, General Douglas MacArthur, he begged the Christians of America to send 5,000 missionaries through an open door that existed in Japan at the time. And it wasn't long after that 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 door began to close. And in 1960, President Eisenhower was prevented from visiting by thousands of demonstrating communists. So what what am I saying? God opens doors. We've got to go through them. He opens doors and we have opportunities to do things, but those doors close. And I don't know about you guys, but I've probably missed some of those doors. How do we miss them? Insecurity. You know, fear. The I can'ts. You know, we miss, we miss some of those doors. And I don't know about you, I don't, I don't want to miss any doors. I don't want to miss any. If God opens a door, I want to be able to go through that door. Now you might say, well, God hasn't called me to be a missionary. Well, that, But you've got to narrow it back down. How about doors in our own homes? Where God says, go in and say you're sorry. That door is open for a while. I'm not going to say I'm sorry. It's her fault. Or his fault. Or it's my parents' fault. It's got to be somebody's fault, but it's not mine. That door is open for a while, but that, that door closes. I believe that this morning, God's also opening a door. He's opening a door for salvation for some of you folks. He's opening up that door and encouraging you to come through. I believe he's opening a door also for some repentance, for people to, to get some things right. I think he's also opening a door this morning for some I'm sorry's. 
in order to clear some things up. He tells them, you have a little strength, you've kept my word, and you have not denied my name. Having a little strength is not always a bad thing. You might look at this and say, well, having a little strength wouldn't be great if you had a lot of strength. Well, sometimes, but sometimes your own strength is useless. I think that really gets in the way of us as Christians. We're self-made men and women. We're, we make it happen. We're movers and shakers. We got our electronic devices. They told us all these electronics are going to make our lives more simple, but they don't. All it's done is just given us more preoccupation with stuff. I don't know if you saw an article, I think it was maybe on the news recently, where they were doing a, a survey of parents neglecting their kids because they're both on the phone. You know, they'll even take them to a park and they'll let them play and you see them, though, and they're both checking, they're both checking everything. The kids are, and you know, it only takes about three seconds to kidnap a kid. And they're gone. Now, I'm not saying electronics are bad. If you guys know me, you know I'm an electronics nerd and I, I love electronics. I'm not saying that they're bad, but everything has to be done in proper order, in proper amounts. This little strength is not so bad because we see in 2 Corinthians that the Lord is made perfect in weakness. What does that mean? When you and I finally come to the place where we say, God, you're God and I'm not and I can't do anything without you. That's a weakness that's made strong through Jesus Christ. Because I think as long as we're in there saying, I got it, don't worry about it, I got it. He'll let you take it. You ever been on a basketball team where one person wanted the ball all the time so they could shoot? <laughs> they know nothing about teamwork. They don't know how it works. You just like, give me the ball, and then they can't, can't shoot anyway. It's like, that's, that's not a... I believe some God says, you want to shoot the ball, shoot the ball, but you're going to miss about 50, 60, 70% of the time. I make it every time. Give me the ball. You're much better off if you let me handle the ball. James 4, 6 says, God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. So here is their little strength. It's not condemned. It's being praised because with that little humble strength, they had managed to keep the gospel pure and they had managed to stay faithful to the Lord. So in, in kind of summation in this part of it, the name of Jesus Christ, the, the way he addresses himself, it's always significant because as Jesus, he is mediator, as Christ, he is the Messiah, and as Lord, he is the master. And I think that we need to, as Christians, he needs to be all of those to us. You see, I think for some of us, he's one or maybe two, but he's not all three. We can't just simply lay it all down and say, Father, not my will, but yours. I know I'm going to get persecuted from time to time. I know I'm going to get made fun of. I know I'm not going to be popular. I know that this is not the way it's being done in the world. I don't care. I'm willing to be weak in order for you to be strong in my life. Look at verse 9. Indeed, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews but are not, but lie. Indeed, I will make them to come and worship before your feet and to know that I have loved you. So he promises them, that particular church at that time, that those who were causing them the most amount of problems, that those who desired to be worshipped themselves, that they would be brought to their knees in worship. And I think we see that on a long term. We're going to see that at the end when every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. I don't know about you guys, but Maranatha, come quickly. I hope that that happens soon. Now again, if you're younger, you may not be, you may think I got my whole life ahead of me. You get a little older and you're like, Lord, I'm sick of it. <laughs> you know, I'm ready. I'm ready to go. Okay, look at verse 10. Because you have kept my commandments to persevere. What does that mean? You have kept my commandments to persevere. What would be the opposite of persevering? Giving up. Giving up. You ever threw up your hands and said, I quit? <laughs> Just giving up. Giving up with their kids because they resist everything we try to teach them. 
giving up on our kids because every time we try to give them a godly principle, they look at us like a deer in the headlights. And they think, oh, you're so archaic, you're so out of touch. I remember one time one of my children said to his mom, he said, you ought to be glad that I don't smoke dope and I, you know, uh, what do you say, I, 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 that I, I'm not sleeping around and I, and I don't smoke dope or something like that. And she said, you ought to be glad that we don't. <laughs> I mean, we could still smoke dope if we wanted to, couldn't we? Why is it such a great honor that you don't? It's like there's this, they don't get it, do they? They don't get it. There's this time where, and, and if you're a young person, I'm not picking on you. It might seem like I am, but I'm not because we're all sinners. But there's this period of time where everything's about us. Everything's about us. Everything's about how we feel. It's everything about how, you know, what we get out of life and who, what people are doing for us. And if anybody tells us anything that we perceive to be negative, we write them off. That's a dangerous place to be, isn't it? Because you miss all the collective wisdom that's around you. Because at that particular time, we know what's best. We don't, because we don't have the experience yet to go along with it, but we think that we do. And so we write off anybody that might, that might have that uh, experience. But we must persevere. We can't, we can't rewrite this because they're harebrains for a period of time. We can't rewrite this because we want to be their friends. We can't rewrite this because we want more friends at work. We can't rewrite this because we want more friends at school. We can't rewrite this because we want to be on American Idol. We can't rewrite this because we want something. You know, every time I see this amazing artist go on American Idol, and you can see their this homegrown girl or guy and they have this sense of morals and, and values and, and it's part of what gets them there, right? And I cringe inside thinking in a year they're not going to be the same person. Every, you know, everything's just, all their, their moral values are going to be sucked out of them because it's not popular. It's going to be taken out of them because you can't market it. You see politicians who are standing strong in the Lord and then they buckle under because of the political pressure. We really need to be praying. When we see that situation, we need to be praying for those individuals because I can't imagine that kind of pressure. Persevere. Folks, I think that that would be the message for us this morning. Don't grow weary in well-doing. It's a, it's a long journey. It's a long journey. And we're not going to make everyone happy, and we're not going to be, you know, there's going to be some folks who, who don't like us because of our stance in Christianity, but we must persevere. Must stand in the things of the Lord. Because you've kept my command to persevere, I will also give, keep you from the hour of trial, which shall come upon the whole world to test those who dwell upon the earth. Now this is one of the, the strongest supporting scriptures for the, uh, the pre-tribulation rapture. Now there has uh, been a lot of controversy over this, you know, Christ's return. And there's a lot of trials that are going to happen and there's a lot of tribulations that are going to happen but not the great tribulation. That's coming at another time. But it is for those who dwell upon the earth. Now got to understand, though we are here, he tells us not to be, to be in the world, but what? Not to be of the world. So we may have our physical location here, but we're, we're living for heaven, aren't we? We're living for heaven. God is telling them, he says, I'm going to keep you from that hour of trial that is about to come upon the whole earth. Because you have what? This huge faith? Because you have this little faith. And because, it, because of that little faith, you have persevered. What does that mean? 
That means that I've kept a hold of Jesus all my life. Until the day that he comes to take us back, I've held on to Jesus Christ. And as a result of that, he's going to keep us from that hour of trouble that's going to come upon the whole earth. Let's move on. Look at verse 11. Behold, I am coming quickly. Hold fast what you have that no one may take your crown. Now this crown does not mean your salvation. There are other various crowns that we get for enduring our faith, keeping our faith till the end. There are crowns for us being uh, looking forward to Christ's return. And the greatest crown, of course, is to be in the presence of God. And he's saying, hold fast to what you have. Guys, I know some of us here this morning, you're down. You're discouraged. You can't go through this life and not be discouraged. Some of the greatest trials we face are right in our own families as we raise our children. It's a tough thing to do. But we have to remind ourselves from time to time who the parents are. <laughs> who has the responsibility before the Lord. I would also like to encourage you in the Lord that those of you who have wayward children, there comes a time when the letting go is the toughest part. And you, you know and you understand that salvation belongs to the Lord and God can still work in their life God will still work in their life and God will continue to bring to bloom all of those seeds that you planted through all of those years we want so much to control that ourselves but we cannot I can't begin to tell you the times that people have told me that you, you know, they prayed for somebody, maybe even somebody in their family, and they prayed for them and prayed for them and prayed for them and prayed for them and prayed for them year after year after year after year, invited them to church, and they don't get it. And all of a sudden, they're gone for a week or two, and they come back and they'll go, guess what? What? I'm saved. How? Oh, somebody came to work, and they were new at work, and they just began to share with me, and uh, I accepted Jesus as my Lord and Savior. And you're going, I've done this for years. I've prayed for years. And it, it never got through. This guy comes in and in two weeks, you're saved. And it's like, you're mad, but you're, you're happy, if that makes any sense. Sometimes with our kids, they, they figure they already know us. They figure they know everything about us, which, by the way, they don't, because they never ask you anything about you, do they? <laughs> they really don't know you. They don't know who you are. They don't know who you were. They don't know what you come from. They, they really don't know. They just assume that they, they know you. So when you begin to tell them, they just, the wall goes up, the switches goes off, and it's like, ah, heard this before, ah, heard this before. Somebody else in their group or somebody else that they, shows up at work, they don't have those walls. They listen and they get saved. And I'm convinced that some people grow up at 20, some people grow up at 50, some people grow up at 70. We all grow up at different times. So as an encouragement to those of you who have children that are still out there, don't give up. Continue to pray. But there comes a time when you just have to let go and say, I can't say it any other way. I can't do it any other way. I've, I've said it every way I know that's possible. And then you just have to let go and you have to just pray. So persevere, folks. Don't let go. Don't grow weary in well-doing. Because God needs us to stay with it. We need each other to stay with it. There are too many things that get in the way. I'm going to ask you to turn to Matthew 13, verse 22. Matthew 13, verse 22. The cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and he becomes unfruitful. I want to be a fruitful Christian. Not a fruity Christian. But I want to be a fruitful Christian. 
You know, I, wanna, I want there to be fruit in my life. I want to see people get saved. I want to see Christians strengthened in the Lord. I, wanna, I, I want the, the, the process to continue to go on in my life. And that's not limited by age. Sometimes I think that we get to a, a certain age in our life and we just figure that God can't use us anymore. God can use us until the moment we die and He can even, even use us through that process. But we need to be fruitful. But there are so many things that come in and, and destroy that fruit. There's so many parasites that come in and one of those is just this world. The deceitfulness of riches. And you might say, well, I don't want to be rich. Oh, yes, you do. <laughs> There's not a person around I, I, I don't know, uh, that I know that's never thought, man, what would it be like if I just had a million dollars? Well, while I'm wishing, <laughs> maybe 10 million, you know. Would life be different? How would I run my life if I had that kind of money? And, and sometimes even our pursuit, our day-to-day -day jobs that we have, Instead of finding something that we love and do what we love, we go find something that just makes us the big bucks. And we're miserable at that. And sometimes you got a husband and a wife, and then those kind of jobs, they demand more out of you, and pretty soon it's not 40 hours a week, it's 50 hours a week, and 60 if they can get them out of you. And at that rate, there's so much stress, and uh, there's no enjoyment of, of life, and we can't, we can't quit, right? We can't, because of having that income now, we've got a car, we've got a house, we've got, you know, kids in school, we've got, we got all this other stuff, so now we can't, can't stop and be happy. We have to continue on the treadmill. We have to continue to keep that, keep that going. So it does apply to us as Christians. We might say, well, you know, I don't want to be rich, but I think this does apply to us. We always, and it's up to you as individuals and me as an individual to know when we're pursuing something that we shouldn't be pursuing. When maybe we're doing something that we shouldn't be doing because you know what? All of these parasites, they threaten every single generation. Every single generation, we have to constantly pick and choose the things that we do so that we're not so, uh, we can't persevere. Because, you know, the enemy loves to get us, if, if he can't mess with our salvation, he tries to mess with our schedule. Because if a Christian can make us too busy, you know what goes first? Prayer and fellowship. Those are the two things that go. Because work's not optional, all right? But those are the things to go. So if he can't do anything with our salvation, he'll just make us too busy to be effective. Galatians 6, 9, let me give you that one. And let us not grow weary while doing good, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Don't lose heart, guys. I know it's tough, but you've got to know this. The person sitting next to you, it's just as tough for them. And the person sitting next to them, it's just as tough for them. We're all in that same boat, and that's why we need to love each other. It's so easy to judge another person, but you don't know what they've gone through. You don't know what they're going through. You don't know what they're coping with. You don't know what medications they have to take. You don't know what's going on. You just, we just don't know what's going on in their life, and it's so easy for us to judge that other individual, but the reality of it is we know very little about that individual. Okay. I need to start closing this up. Look at verse 12. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go out no more. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from God, and I will write on him a new name. 1 John 5, 5 says, Who is he who overcomes the world? But he who believes that Jesus is the Son. Of God. You see that? See how it ties that all together? Who's the overcomer? He says, those who overcome, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. He will no longer have to go out. He, does, he says all of these awesome things. He says, I'm even going to give you a new name. And then John 5, 5 tells us who the overcomer is. And the overcomer is that one who believes on Jesus 
and believes that he is the son of God. Do you believe in him this morning? And I don't mean just believe about him, but do you believe in him? Do you believe he's the son of God? He made it absolutely clear in the Bible he was more than a prophet. He made it absolutely clear he was more than a welfare organization. He made it absolutely clear because all of those things he was doing and everybody loved him, when he began to stand up and say, I am God, then that's when they called him a blasphemer. That's when they wanted to crucify him is when he said he was God. That's still the dividing factor for all of us. And that is we can believe he was a great prophet. We can believe he was a great teacher, a great humanitarian. Did a whole lot of things. But it's not until we believe he is God that we become born again. And when we become born again, then we believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And then heaven awaits us. Look at verse 13. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So, it's a message for the church. And I think that message for us is, we can't love without Jesus. Not the right way. We can care about each other. We can be benevolent. We can be giving. We can have a lot of the characteristics of a good person. But it's not the same as God's love. Someone can know that you love them with the love of the Lord and you might not be able to give them anything except for that love. And I believe that's the kind of love that every church needs. I believe it's the kind of love that a home needs. You know, those little boys and those little girls, they need to know mommy and daddy love them. And I don't care if you're 5 or if you're 50 or if you're 60. If you grew up like I did without a dad and you never had a father say, I love you, that impacts your life. That impacts your life. If you grew up at home and you never had a mother who said, I love you, that impacts your life. We get the opportunity to say that to each other. What a cool deal. To be able to love each other. When he says, let the church hear, or he who has an ear, let him, you know, let the, let him hear what the, church, uh, what the Spirit says to the churches. I believe he's saying, we've got to listen not just with our ears. And I think that we do that a lot, don't we? We listen with our ears, but we don't listen to her, listen with our heart. The, the typical picture of wife talking to the husband, he's got the newspaper up, of course, not newspapers anymore, he's got the iPad. Mm -hmm, yeah, hon, I love you too, that's awesome. And then if they're like me, later in the day, they're calling them up and say, what did you have going on today? I told you this morning. Oh, yeah. Got to listen with the heart, and we got to listen to our kids with our heart, not just our ears. But if you're a young person here, you got to listen to us too. And you got to listen with your heart also and not just your ears. Find the love in there. I believe also he's saying to us to hang in there. I believe this is a message of hope and promise to the church. And I think it's also a good time to ask, how am I doing in the area of love? Now I'm not talking about love for self. We got a lot of ways that we love ourselves. Whether it's our choice in the car, whether it's our choice in the in the place that we sit at home, our seat or our couch, or the things that we like, our toys, whatever they are. We've got lots of ways to make ourselves happy. But that's not the kind of love I'm talking about. And I don't believe that's the kind of love that that he's talking about here. How are we doing in that love for other people when you don't want to do something and you get up and do it anyway? Isn't that the mark of real love? Isn't that the, the kind of sacrificial love? When somebody might ask us to do something, we really don't want to stop what we're doing to do it, but we get up and do it anyway. 